be a little Nexus action going on. And joining me, of course, is the inimitable Paul Cheon. Here I am again. Great to have you, Paul. <laughs> Here I am hey, again. Paul. Hey, hey, guys. Okay, Bye. so I, I want to get the breakdown from you, Cedric slash Paul. Uh, so, so I'm a split card. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Which means you have the combined value of both Paul Woo. and Cedric. Woo, baby. Okay, so Simon Gertzen has the Simic Ramp deck that has a whole lot of mana generated creatures. It has Nexus of Fate. It doesn't have Wilderness Reclamation. Matias Leverado does have the more traditional Simic, Nexus of Fate, Wilderness Reclamation, infinite looping type of deck. Talk about who you think has the edge in this unusual type of matchup. I am a big Simon Gertzen guy, huge fan. I've played against him in my only time at the World Championship in Rome much earlier yeah. this year. Uh, it's not good news. It's not good news for Simon, who's having a great tournament. So he came to this tournament trying to beat specifically Esper style, Esper style strategies, yeah. and that is working to perfection. The one thing that he did coming into this yeah. tournament was thinking, I'm not going to play against other Simic decks. He's playing against a traditional Simic deck. Yeah. Yeah. The card that he cut as Wilderness Reclamation is the best card in the matchup. He doesn't have them. Yeah, so that's going to be a little weird. There, uh, There's also some interesting tools that Simon has in the sideboard that could potentially help. But, yeah. I mean, just in terms of raw base 60 cards that we're starting with. Doesn't look too hot for Simon, but Simic versus Simic is going to wind up being a very weird and funky matchup. Becca, let's bring out the players. Thanks, Day9. All right, coming to the stage right now. Recently retired from the coverage team from Pro Tour San Diego Champion 2010. Played 17 Pro Tours and four World Championships. It's Simon Goodson. player from Argentina, World Magic Cup Team 2012 and Top 8 Nationals 2010, we have Matias Leverado. See this Simic versus Simic, let's head on over to Marshall and Paul who have the call. Thank you, Becca. Welcome back to the booth here. That's Paul Chiena, Marshall Sutcliffe. Thanks so much for coming along for coverage here of Mythic Championship 3. So we're sitting down and things have well and truly heated up for our players because now we're in the stage of the tournament, Paul, where a win advances you to day two. Right, both players sitting at five. So the magic number, of course, is six. You pick up win number six, you are locked into day two. Now, given that both of these players are sitting at five and one, they still have a chance, of course, in the next round. Right, and that's, of course, the key here. They're they're in a position, beautiful spot to be, by the way. We call it free roll, right? Right. They can win this match and advance through. Done deal. They get to exit the building. I mean, they're literally done for the day, and we'll see them tomorrow. But if they get unfortunate and happen to lose this one, they get to come back next round for another shot at it. Absolutely. And on top of that, of course, there is a possibility of a few couple of X3s making it into day two as well. And yes. given that these players do have very strong records right now, they probably have some of the stronger tie breaks in the tournament. That's right. So lots of action lined up for you here. Now, as far as deck lists go, they are both on Simic. I see Hydroid Crasis's. I see a whole bunch of stuff going on. So let's get into the match here, Paul. And uh, looks like we're going to be following along with Simon down on the bottom part of your screen. Dude, that shirt is. It's a shirt. Nice. <laughs> it's a shirt. <laughs> and uh, looks like we're underway here. So there's a couple of key th differences here in the matchup. And Cedric already alluded to it earlier, where Leverato is playing the more traditional version of the Simic Nexus deck, which is trying to play Growth Spirals into Wilderness Reclamation. And Wilderness Reclamation is one of the most powerful cards in the matchup. Now, the thing that Simon has going for him is he's got a little more explosiveness. He's playing four copies of Llanowar Elf on top of four copies of Incubation Druid. So he's got a little more ramp going on to be able to hopefully try to kind of win with the big Nissa. But I think just kind of going into this matchup, I would have to favor Leverato's side because Wilderness Reclamation is just so, so powerful. And in this matchup, you'd rather have that than Nissa. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And I believe Leverato has Nissa as well. Oh, let me double check. He's that. got one. He's got one. Okay, he's got this. one. But we see that Simon is like leaning on Nissa much harder. Right. But we are underway here, and I'll tell you what, 
Incubation Druid into Jade Light Ranger versus a Narset. Well, take the creatures here. Yeah, but Nar you did get the two activations here from the Narset, and of course Narset's static ability is still very, very strong in the matchup. However, Jade Light Ranger will likely make quick work of that Narset. Another card that uh, Leverado has is Root Snare. Again, go in with a more traditional build for this type of archetype, this, uh, this Nexus deck. Yeah, Roots there, one of, not a great card here, but no. it looks like we're going to see a Tamiyo here on plus one. Wilderness, Re yep, Leverado recognizing as well that Wilderness Reclamation is the card that you're looking for in this matchup and named it here off Tamiyo. So Simon's going to deduce that he doesn't have one and is really, really wanting to find one, but that could give him a window here. Here comes Jade Light Ranger to take a chunk out of Tamiyo's Loyalty down to two. Blast Zone is going to be the play here, though. He does have access to his own copy of Tamiyo or Blink of an Eye. So really interesting there. Simon had the option of just running out Tamiyo there and naming a card and just kind of get that going. Yeah. But instead, he's looking to keep up mana for Blink of an Eye while also just keeping up the ability to potentially adapt Incubation Druid. And look at this. It was... Once again, Wilderness Reclamation named by Tamio for Leverado, and he hit one. So yeah, now Leverado has to decide what he wants to do here. Does he want to run out Wilderness Reclamation into all this open mana? No. Or does he just want to pass the turn and play Chemister's Insight? Yeah, he's decided against casting it. So now Simon has the green light to adapt that Incubation Druid like you described. If he really wanted, he could blink of an eye. But this is going to give him three mana just from the Incubation Druid itself with the four mana on the battlefield plus an additional land. That gives him access to eight mana next turn. It Paul. does. That's a big game. Yeah, I mean, he could just choose to cast the Nexus of Fate here if he wants, get an attack with the Jaylight Ranger. That would give him a nice opportunity to kind of just pick off all the Planeswalkers that are on the battlefield. Yeah. And now that he drew Land War Elves, he wow. can actually play Nexus of Fate, attack, and also play Land War Elves. Yeah, this is actually quite impressive. You know, the, the thing that you are always telling me this is what you're looking for when you start casting Nexus of Fate, is to either have enough creatures to, to you know, kill your opponent or manage their Planeswalkers, or you want to have your own recursive sources of value, like your own Planeswalkers. Right, but even having creatures with relevant power also yeah. will do a lot of work. Absolutely. So, a lot of decisions here for Simon. I mean, he could do a number of different things. He could play Nexus of Fate. He could also just choose to play Tamiyo and Llanowar Elves and keep up Blink of an Eye. Now, Simon decided to attack Jade Light Ranger into Tamiyo, as we expected, uh, but Leverado used a copy of Root Snare to protect, to protect his Planeswalker. So now we're going to see that Llanowar Elves and Nexus of Fate play, and all of a sudden Simon's sitting here with eight power on the battlefield and an extra turn coming with Tamiyo available and Blink of an Eye. Yeah, this is big. Even that, even that one Llanowar Elf by itself, now it's nice. You can actually just use the Llanowar Elf to finish off the Narset, that's in play. Then you can use the Jade Light Ranger to finish off the Tamiyo and likely going to be using the Incubation Druid for its mana and not the damage. Of course, the Root Snare will have worn off now as we're in a new turn for Simon. And the important thing for Simon is just to make sure that he keeps up Blink of an Eye. It doesn't even necessarily need to be kicked, but it's important for him to have Blink of an Eye so that he can respond to that Wilderness Reclamation he knows Leverato has in hand. He needs to be able to fire that blink of an eye off prior to the end step so that the Wilderness Reclamation trigger does not occur. Simon doesn't have quite enough mana here to cast Tamiyo and maybe try to find something along the lines of uh, Nexus of Fate. So instead, he's going to go for Nissa, which he did not find. Shuffle the Nexus back in. And he's got Tamiyo on six. So as you described before, Paul, he does have the ability now, though, to manage the Planeswalkers in a very meaningful way, leaving Leverado with none of them. Yeah, and I think he's going to keep up the, the ability to blink of an eye. I really like this play. If Leverato, now Leverato's on the back foot, I think he just kind of has to slam the Wilderness Reclamation and hope for the best. But now Simon, because Narset is no longer on the battlefield, can even get value off that blink of an eye, kick it and draw a card while also bouncing that Reclamation. Wow. So Simon just playing the tempo game here. Yeah, beautifully as well. I have to say with the double blink of an eye, you know, he's had those in his hand since we joined the game, and uh, he's really leveraged that. He hasn't have, have actually had to cast one yet. Ooh, th but this is a nice draw, actually. He has a callous dismissal. 
So what Leverata can choose to do here is cast Callus Dismissal on Incubation Druid. Even if Simon floats mana, he can then move oh. to the next main phase and play that Wilderness Reclamation and get a trigger if he wants. He will not have the mana to cast Nexus of Fate, but he's still going to be able to get that untap effect. So is this a misstep then from Gertzen? Should he have cast his Tamiyo using mana from Incubation Druid in a land and had four lands untapped? Yes, I believe that's what he should have done. Okay, well, let's see if he gets punished for it here. We know that this will clear the way for Leverado to uh, reset the Druid and also have a window where Simon only has one mana available if he chooses to go to his second main phase where the mana pool will drain out. And Simon's probably just going to run out of Growth Spiral here because he knows that Leverato is not going to run out Wilderness Reclamation here. He left himself two blue mana in his pool, though it looks like they're going to lay fallow here as Incubation Druid's going to be back in his hand. And now with, it, with the priority back on Leverato, he can say, I want to I go to combat. And there's nothing that Simon can do other than blink of an eye the token if he really cares. He does not, so we're in the second main phase now for Leverado. And with that land drop, he can now resolve a Wilderness Reclamation and even get that first trigger off of it. Now, he doesn't have quite enough mana to start chaining Nexuses, though, does he? He doesn't, so he will be able to cast a Chemister's Insight, but yes, Simon would have been in much more trouble if Leverado had seven lands in play. Right. So even though this is a setback for Gertzen, it looks like it's not a disaster, as he still does have two copies of Blink of an Eye, so he can send that Wilderness Reclamation back to hand and try to leverage this onboard advantage that he's gained, specifically from Tamiyo here. What can he get with Tamiyo? That's the question. Yeah, There's Hydroid Crisis, by the way. It's actually really interesting. Because Simon does have a Nexus of Fate in hand, I don't know if Simon has a land in his graveyard. He could choose to minus Tamiyo oh. to get a land back. Oh, thank you, Simon. There you, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So if he does get that land, then he can go ahead and just make sure he hits his land drop and then just play Nexus of Fate and just get an additional turn. Because getting an additional activation from Tamiyo is very valuable. That's right. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to take your line, Paul, and he's going to set himself a little stop on the end step. But in the meantime, he can get in with that Jade Light Ranger. And these are big chunks of damage, make no mistake, especially when, sure, he only has one Nexus of Fate right now, but it doesn't take too many before that Jade Light Ranger starts looking really scary if you're sitting in Leverato's seat. And have a whole lot he can do at this point. Right, so Leverato doesn't even need to fire off Chemister's Insight as Simon does get another turn. And Simon can just, you know, he can start naming Nexus of Fate now with yes. Tamiyo. He does have the seven mana now. And, hey, <laughs> if he can just rattle off five in a row, he would be able to win this game. All right, let's see if he's going to name Nexus. There it is. Does he hit one? This is a big moment. No. No, he did not. Of course, one of the hidden upsides to Tamiyo is that she keeps putting more cards in your graveyard, which are not the card that you name, so you actually become more and more likely to hit the further that you go. Yeah, but I think Simon's in really good shape. He's drawn the, both copies of Blink of an Eye, mm -hmm. which is a really good job of interacting with the Wilderness Reclamation. So what he can choose to do now is, you know, put maybe uh, both of his mana creatures onto the battlefield and still keep up Blink of an Eye. And because Leverado doesn't have eight lands in play, Simon can't simply just bounce the, S Simon can bounce the Wilderness Reclamation. If Leverado plays it again, Simon can bounce it again, but Leverado can't play it twice in one turn. By the way, Simon taps the land or else for the other land or else. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not messing around this time. Right. And it looks like he's decided to keep up Blink of an Eye kicked and Blink of an Eye, or just two Blink of an Eyes. Right. I should say, uh, rather than casting the Incubation Druid this turn as he passes the turn back. Now, this is a big opportunity here for Leverado. He is going to have seven mana. He does have Wilderness Reclamation as well. But uh, again, that blink of an eye could really throw a wrench in the works. Absolutely. And Simon prioritizing the ability to cast two of them if needed. Yeah, but... It's a lot of Nexus of Fates but, in hand but, but for Leverado. Yeah, all those Nexus of Fates are still going to do a lot of work because Simon is forced to play Blink of an Eye on the Reclamation, but despite that, Leverado can still just fire off Nexus of Fate. What, what I would do if I was in Leverado's position here is just kind of wait to get to my end step, get that, make sure that trigger on the Wilderness Reclamation happens, then try to fire off a bunch of Nexus of Fates. Mm -hmm. Of course, Simon, in his side of the table, will not allow that to happen. He has to use Blink of an Eye here to bounce that Wilderness Reclamation.
All right, well, the army token's going to attack Tamyo, but that's going to get blocked by the last untapped creature there, Lanamore Elves. And now we see, by the way, the real game plan here for Simon Gertzen is he's going to fire up, well, blink of an eye. This is really interesting. And, and now I'm curious to, to see what Leverato is going to do. So Leverato can run out the Wilderness Reclamation again. If he does, Simon has a second blink of an eye. But it's so unlikely for him to have it. So I think he might be tempted to just play it out. Alternatively, he can just play Nexus of Fate and then just try to do everything again next turn when he has access to eight mana. That's right. Blink of an eye not, does not interact, of course. And th what you saw there was Leverato announcing So verbally. this is the window. This yes, is the window. this is it. So now Simon can re-blink of an eye here yeah, and, and shut out uh, Leverato for this look turn. And look <laughs> at the face of Leverato. He's like, wow, he has another one. And it makes sense. You don't play around the second one. It only really plays two copies of blink of an eye. So he was just running the numbers. He goes, it's really unlikely for this to happen. So I'm just going to run it out because I know that it's fairly safe for me to go for Nexus of Fate. However, Simon... Heads up play, keeping up all six mana to have access to double blink of an eye. Now, if he gets a little bit lucky here with the Tamiyo, he might actually be able to steal this game. Yeah, he might be able to uh, chain a couple of turns together. And with five power on the battlefield, he could get the job done. He also does have action. I mean, let's not forget Hydroid Craze is sitting in hand as well. By the way, Simon, looking real smart, right, for keeping up both copies of blink rather than choosing to run out the incubation druid. And right. he got a card off of it thanks to that. Here comes Narset, Parter of Veils, though, for Leverado. Remember, we're still in his second uh, main phase. And unfortunately for Simon now, these two Hydroid Craces look a lot worse. But there's a Tamiyo activation in the bank, and that's what's important. Nothing that great in the graveyard. The blink of an eye is not going to be as effective now that Leverado has access to eight mana next turn. So it might be... <laughs> Simon's best chance here might just be to tick up Tamiyo and name Nexus of Fate and just try to chain a few of those together. Oh, my goodness. That would be, uh, you know, that ability goes on the stack, and it's like Simon's game right. is on the stack. <laughs> because Leverado's hand is absolutely stacked. Take a look at that. He's got Tamiyo, Wilderness Wreck, and triple Nexus of Fate. So it looks like Simon's going to take a more conservative route. He's going to go minus three oh. to get back a blink of an eye to try to defend himself from that wilderness reclamation. Yeah, but I'm not even sure if that's the safer line necessarily because all Leverato needs is land number eight to kind of counteract what you're trying to do with Blink of an Eye. Just recast it, right. Oh, but it looks like Simon just wants to add more to the board here, get that Narset off the board, and just try to put a lot of pressure here with the Hydroid Crisis. So he's going to play it for three. No, four. He tapped the elves as well. And thanks to getting rid of Narset, he actually gets the cards. And there is Anissa who shakes the world as well. So Simon perhaps changing gears just a little bit here, trying to keep his opponent off balance enough. But he has developed quite a nice board here. Look at that. And Leverato here cannot play Tamiyo Collector of Tales. If he does, he's in a lot of trouble. So what, And because he knows that Blink of an Eye is in Simon's hand, now what he wants to do is pass priority make Simon cast that blink of an eye. If he does, and he didn't even play his land, to just kind of give Simon the opportunity to maybe go for the bounce here and then play that forest untapped, play Wilderness Reclamation, play Nexus of Fate untapped, and then he's firmly in the driver's seat after that. It worked exactly like you described it there, Paul, and that is Leverado completing his game plan, and here we go. Wilderness Reclamation plus triple Nexus of Fate. This is going to be very difficult for Simon to survive. Over the course of the next four turns, all he can do is sit on his hands and watch. Right, and now now we're going to see multiple acti uh, Planeswalker activations from Tamiyo. You can see Tamiyo potentially naming Nexus of Fate. Given that there's two in his hand, maybe he'll name something else at least for this turn. But yeah, things are, things are looking... Phenomenal here. Yeah, it looks like he named Search for Ascanta here. And he gets to just do all of these things. Grow Spiral, Opt, Tamiyo Plus, and then, of course, on his end step, let's run it all back and take another turn with Nexus of Fate. This is exactly what Leverado was trying so hard to work for. Over the course of this game, Simon simply would not allow it, but his defenses have finally ran out. And now Leverado is going off. Their search for his Kanta, the card he wanted anyway. Yeah, and he might just play Nexus of Fate first, then plus Tamiyo, because then you have a higher chance of finding Nexus of Fate with the Tamiyo. 
because it shuffles it back into the deck, but a lot of different options here. Oh, I did not see that there was a second Wilderness Reclamation in the graveyard, which is also huge because every extra Wilderness Reclamation in play means you're getting nine more mana and additional activations for Mascanta the Sunken Ruin, which will go off next turn after this Nexus of Fate. And of course, now it's about ways to keep finding copies of Nexus of Fate. And as you mentioned, well, he's got multiples to do that. The Tamyo helps dig, and that library is going to be start getting more compact, more compact around the card Nexus of Fate. And then on top of it, as you just mentioned a second ago, the search for his Kanta, once it transforms, is a great way to dig through your library and find those copies of Nexus. So we are fully in go-off mode here, though I will say that Leverado's hand doesn't look super exciting at the moment. Lebrado thrilled about the auto tapper here. As the <laughs> there'll yes. be lots of mana here that he would need to tap. But yeah, things are. Oh, hey, hey, just hey! Just naturally draw it. No big deal. Let's not forget the old draw step. There's Nexus of Fate and Simon, playing a similar build on his side, though with some significant differences. Certainly knows how this part goes. And again, all he really can do at this point is just sit and watch. Yeah, and you know, even when we previewed this matchup, this this is the card that we were talking about. Wilderness Reclamation is so pivotal, so important in this matchup. It just gives you such a huge mana edge here. And this deck was kind of just built to abuse that. You have all those chemistries inside. You have Surge for Ascanta, and the fact that one deck has it, and the, uh, the, you, you just see the power. This is what lets you go over the top. And it looks like Simon's going to go ahead and... Uh, <laughs> Just say, good game, and then scoop it up. So that was a real kind of a classic Nexus fight there as they were fighting over the important permanence and the important spells. But you see a little head shake there from Simon. It did not pan out for him. And calm, cool, and collected. Leverado just worked his way through. I mean, you could see he was a little shook when Simon had the double blink of an eye, but he just said, all right, well, we'll just try it again next turn. Yep. Set him up a little bit with the with the no land drop, but Simon didn't really have much of a choice anyway, and then yeah, boom, it, finished Yeah, Simon's him hand up. was basically forced, but I still like what Leverato did with his sequencing there. Agreed, yep. So that is Matias Leverato with game number one, and now we're going to go to sideboards. Boy, Paul, you and I have been talking about Esper sideboards all day where it's like, oh, well, you know, you got this creature removal and you want to take that out because your opponent's not playing creatures. Things get a little weird here. Um, <laughs> what do we do? What are we looking at? Well, it looks like Simon is, uh, it's kind of a minimal sideboard plan here. He's got a couple of negates that he's bringing in, and he's bringing in Thrashing Brontodon. Thrashing Brontodon, of course, makes a lot of sense. It's not mostly, it's not, it's mostly there to have an answer to Wilderness Reclamation. Sure, every, sure, it's a, it's a decent creature that attacks, but he just wants to make sure that he has a couple of answers. And the gate also gives him an additional couple of answers to the Wilderness Reclamation. I will say, though, things looking very good for Leverado because, you know, he had Root Snares in his deck. Now he can just happily take those out as well. Uh, they're not going to be especially strong. Uh, looks like he's got two showing right now in his deck, so maybe he's kind of concerned that he might get run over by Jaylight Rangers. And if you have to, you can fire one off. You can get it back with Tamio. It just gives you a little bit of that, that insurance policy, if you will. But uh, unclear what, Leverot, what else Leverot is going to go for. But, you know, most of the decks have similar packages here. They, they have, there's three negates in his sideboard. I imagine that's going to be coming in. And uh, just curious to see if he goes with the creature plan. Doesn't look like Simon's going for it. So I would, I would also be a little bit surprised if Leverata chose to go for it as well. I can see Paradise Druid being a card that he brings in because it just makes your deck a little more explosive. And of course, neither deck really plays any removal. All right, game number two. Incoming here, Growth Spiral, Blink of an Eye, Nissa, and four lands is a snap keep there for Simon. He's going to run out the breeding pool and pass the turn back. Opt available here on turn one for Leverado. So both players doing things with their mana early. Looks like a growth spiral here for uh, for Gertsen. Oh, and look at that. And he hit it. Found himself a Llanowar Elf. And so now we're looking at next turn Nissa. And that's exactly why he played that main step, because he wanted to give himself the opportunity to find something like Llanowar Elves. Wow, that is such a powerful rip, finding that Llanowar Elves. It is this is huge. a turn three Nissa it is, on the it play? It is huge, <laughs> what yes. The, <laughs> uh, the Land Wolf was the best possible card wow. he could hit with that Growth Spiral. Simon, of course, gives away absolutely <laughs> nothing. But that was fantastic here for Gertsen. So 
now all he has to think about is negate. But what are you going to do about it anyway? He's right? got nothing else to right. do with his hand. I mean, he, he, there are situations where you have a lot of action in your hand where you can maybe try to play thi around things. But Simon, basically, I mean, that's what this hand was meant to do. It's I'm going to play turn three Nissa. Hope you don't have anything, and hope that it's good enough to get there. Yeah, and having this in play a turn earlier is so huge. Uh, yeah, lots of pressure right, now right. on Leverado. He is... And, and now we have the Breeding Pool. Simon even has the ability to cast Blink of an Eye here off the Breeding Pool. Nissa, who shakes the world, static ability. Any forest that gets tapped, taps for an additional green man. And of course, all the dual lands are forests. Breeding Pool is both an island and a forest, so you can tap it for blue and it will still generate a green mana with Nissa. But instead from Leverado, nothing. He's just going to pass the turn back. And uh, and once again, Simon Gertzen firmly in the driver's seat here in game number two off of that explosive turn two into turn three Nissa. Yeah, so, so, so a big heads up play. You almost saw Simon choose to tap three mana and um, run out the J Light Ranger, but it looks like he wants to activate Nissa first before that happens because if he chose to play the J Light Ranger, Leverato could have simply just cast Blink of an Eye and bounced Nissa, and Simon would not have gotten that 3 3 body. Ah, uh, sure. So Simon's like, well, let's just back up a little bit right. here. Of course, he gets the extra mana off of tapping it first as well. Now, J Light Ranger hits the battlefield and tries to set up his next few draw steps, Ooh. and wow, two lands off the top of the library there for Gertzen as well. And Clearing those away is nice. Yeah, this is a huge board for Simon. This is a yeah. ton of pressure. Yeah, he's down to 10 already. Leverado, if he doesn't want to fire off a blink of an eye. Yeah, he probably will. I imagine he's just going to use it on the Nissa here for Simon to kind of take a turn off to cast it again. The thing's not looking great. Yeah, being this behind on board is just brutal when you're sitting in Leverado's seat because he's actually forced to try to win the game rather than trying to come back because he doesn't have any way to sweep the board. Exactly. He's got the root snares to try to buy him some time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually not horrible. I mean, he can actually run out of Nissa here, untap Breeding Pool, and keep up root snare. However, Simon does have Blink of an Eye, so he can also choose to cast Blink of an Eye end of turn, bounce Nissa, which would then prevent Leverado from having the mana to cast that root snare in hand. Now that Nissa is gone, this blink of an eye is not kickable, but he can still cast it. Right. We will not fail. Yeah, curious to see if Simon's going to go for the unkicked blink of an eye here to not get root snared, or if he's just going to. Oh, look, or, or maybe even do it in response so he can't get negated as well. Yeah, I think he's thinking about negate here. Yeah, that's what it feels like here. Unfortunately. <clears throat> Again, with, with Nissagon, Simon actually doesn't have the mana anymore to pay for the uh, for the kicker cost. So he's going to have to settle if he wants to make this play for an unkicked blink of an eye. Oh, and it feels so bad. It does. I, you know, because I think he had it in his head before, like, right. well, I can just kick this. But again, mana is no longer making double mana there. Excuse me, his lands are no, no longer making double. So Leverato is not quite dead yet. No, but he is approaching it. He could trade off, take three, six, seven, eight, nine, and go to one. Right. I guess Simon just blocks here, right? Yeah, I mean, he did tap out for the turn, and, and Leverado is going to block next turn, so. Right. It's like three, three free but, damage. Uh, but does this shut him off of the mana? Let's you know. He can still play Nissa with the Land War Elf. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he's going to do. And he's still crashing in for a heck of a lot of damage here. Three, six, seven, eight, nine puts you to one. No, sorry, no, it's actually eight. eight puts you to two. All right, well, I think Leverado still has a chance here. Leverado so can. What does it look like? Oh, no, uh, not having the breeding pool. No, no, he has a forest. Okay, so what he can do is play Hinterland Harbor, play Nissa, turn the forest into a land, and then keep up Root Snare. Then okay. he'll be able to untap with Nissa and hope to draw something. Okay, that is that is actually a legit plan here. And I imagine uh, an upkeep root snare here to prevent Simon from top decking something like a negate to counter the fog effect. Yeah, that would be very astute here of Leverado because he needs to cast it regardless, right? That's the thing that right. you try to conceal that information for as long as you can. But in this case, 
he has to cast it either way or else he's just dead so you may as well prevent your opponent from being able to draw some type of counter magic though it looks like leverado has not done that but he didn't get punished because there yeah. was no uh negate yeah, it'll be interesting to see he, he might have to fire it off in response to tamio plus yeah yeah once that plus resolves it's too late. Okay, well, it looks like Simon's looking to just lock this thing up by getting Blink of an Eye back. But Blink of an Eye... Yeah, can't hit, can't hit a forest, but it can hit a Nyssa. Right. And this does mean that Leverado won't have access to a ton of mana when he gets to untap with that Nyssa. Yeah. Yeah, if, if he needs to take another turn to recommit Nyssa to the board, that's pretty rough for him. Also, he has to... Well, he'll have the five mana at least as Root Snare is going to get hit at some point here. Yeah, no need to really attack with anything else other than just the Vigilant lands, as they are all individually lethal attackers. And and this forces the issue. This says you must have Root Snare or you die. And but then, and then Simon does. Right, and Simon should use Blink of an Eye here because he doesn't want Leverado to untap with that extra forest in play, giving, giving him that additional mana. Yeah, good call, Paul, and that's exactly what Simon's doing here. So Nissa back to hand once again, and while long-term plans-wise, ooh, there's a negate too. Though he doesn't have the mana, does he? It's does a not. harbor, so he cannot. But whatever, I, it feels like Simon has uh, has gotten the job done here. Yeah, that negate was actually huge because actually Leverado actually drew another root snare here mm -hmm. to live for another turn. So he, he still thinks there's hope. He goes, I'm going to play Nissa, I'm going to untap my lands, and then I'm going to have access to root snare. Yep. The real question here is, does Leverato have the mana to play Nissa? and then keep up root snare and negate. Oh, let's see. Well, he can't play the breeding pool untapped. Right. Ouch. So the answer to your question is no. He, he'll have to choose one or the other, right. but that's not going to get the job done. And of course, he's not in a position to play around a whole lot. You know what he can actually choose to do? Hmm. It's a slightly safer line, but he has to absolutely know that Simon has negate in hand, is just not play Nyssa, and just go for root snare here, and then... Uh, keep up the oh. negate backup, but I think that's mostly a losing play most of the time. I mean, he didn't have a negate last turn, so it's really unlikely that he has one now. Here's Narset Parter avails instead of Nissa, which finds the Tamio, but that is not going to get the job done. And I think Simon can breathe a sigh of relief here. I want to remind you, by the way, uh, you know what we're watching here is a winning in for day two. This this the winner of this match will advance to day two, which is a huge accomplishment out of this field. Only 12 of the 64 players playing today are going to advance. There are 68 players in the field. Of course, four of them earned their way into day two by winning their division at the MPL weekly events, and those were, of course, for the MPL players specifically. Negate is the name there. But Does this should hit. be academic, given that he gate already in hand. Just in case. Yep. Just in case. Backup plans for your backup plans. But in the meantime, this is easily a lethal attack. Again, Leverado says, well, you know, I've got another root snare here. But Simon snaps it off. And uh, yeah, a, a nod of approval there from Leverado. He doesn't look happy about it, but he says, sure, I'll take it all. And that is minus 13 life, which means you are dead, sir. Now, that means for us, though, Viewers, Paul, you, me, we get a game three, baby. Yeah, and I will say that second root snare actually gives Simon a good amount of information because he, you're not sure how many root snares your opponent kept in, but knowing that your opponent now has at least two, you know, you, you might not take as aggressive lines to go all in and try to go for a lethal attack because of the presence of those root snares. Looks like Simon shaved a couple lands here. Look at that. He's got two blast zones in this sideboard. Mm, spicy. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're playing a matchup where your opponent doesn't have any removal whatsoever, you don't need as many mana sources. Right, because he, he has a land of War Elves and the Incubation Druids, both times four plus growth spiral, growth spiral and Jay Light Ranger to help you get lands too. Yeah, it's funny because after having cut those, he's down to 24 lands. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is kind of the standard amount for a, you know, Just a, a normal deck. Just a normal deck, yeah. yeah. Okay, game three incoming, and of course, 
This game is going to decide the match. Who is going to advance today to? Is it going to be Simon Gertzen? Is it going to be Matias Leverado? We are going to find out right now. That is a very expensive opening hand for Simon. Yeah, he's he got can't keep five this. lands, a seven and a five. He just doesn't do enough. This is also kind of a slow hand. Every, uh, Memorial to Genius and Hinterland Harbor both come into play tapped. He is on the play, however. And Simon's going to send that one back, but keep this with Incubation Druid, Growth Spiral, and the top of his library. Yeah, <laughs> and this is a great hand. I mean, Simon's going to be able to go turn two Accelerant into turn three Tamiyo. And, well, I was going to say currently Leverada doesn't have an answer, but it looks like he drew Negate <laughs> off the top. Yeah, he wasted no time with that. Simon now choosing between the Druid or Growth Spiral. If he goes for Growth Spiral, there's a little more upside because you can't yep. find a Llanowar Elf. And that was kind of what sealed the deal for the last game, actually. It'd be a really interesting game if he didn't draw a Llanowar Elf there, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like Leverado might have found a victory there because as it stood, Simon still was cutting it fairly close. And that exactly. was with turn three Nissa on the play yeah. against an empty board, of course. And even then, Leverado really fought the good fight and uh, made it a game. All right, so he's going to go for the Incubation Druid rather than the, the uh, Growth Spiral. He has three other lands in hand. He knows he's guaranteed to still be able to play an extra land off of that. And there's another one off the top of the library. So does he just run out Tamiyo? I mean, he doesn't wow, have a Wow, another whole negate drawn, by the yeah. way. There's not a whole lot else to do, so very curious to see if, time, if Simon's just going to run this out or play around negate. It looks like he's definitely considering playing around negate by just playing a Growth Spiral here. Wow, okay. You saw in the tricky Simon. I know. Well, I mean, the thing is, you saw in the previous game, he actually chose to just run out the Nissa on turn three. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, he chose to go with the Growth Spiral and just develop his mana a little bit more instead. Wow, he looks smart for doing it too with double negate in hand. He played around that. Now he can do this again, where he instead of playing Tamio, he could opt to just pass the turn. I think we're going to see an attack for fire three. up the Druid here. Yeah, or do that. Either way, he could sink his mana into into Incubation Druid this turn rather than risking Tamiyo getting negated. Because right now, Leverado's not really doing much, just playing right. lands. I don't, think I, mind that, missing those I don't think I mind that play, honestly. I mean, what can Leverado do if you do that, right? Like, you can have a blink of an eye, but you can't even kick it. So, and Leverado missing, desperately needing land number four next turn. And yeah, Simon just getting aggressive with the Incubation Druid. This sets him up really nicely next turn because now he's gonna have access to nine mana next turn. And once again, with pressure now from Simon, Leverado is so much less likely to be able to just sit back on the gate forever because Simon can say, okay, I'm just going to keep attacking. And once, once Leverado taps out for something, then look at that double Nexus of Fate and Tamio in hand for Gertz, and he can just flood the board. Yeah. Now, Leverado showing some real patience here as well and recognizing that while it is a bit annoying to keep getting hit by an Incubation Druid, he is at 17, and it's only three damage per turn. He does have time. Yeah, now now do you run out to Tamiyo? You don't have a whole lot else to do, or do you just continue attacking for three? I feel like Simon is more likely to just be consistent here. Okay, I see what he's trying to uh, do. Ah, he's going to he, go for Nexus? Yeah, he's just passing the turn and going for an end-of-turn Nexus of Fate, which sets him up really nicely for the following turn. Yeah, he, he is absolutely respecting the possibility of Negate here, and he's going to try to bait it out with a Nexus of Fate on end step. Let's see if it works. It might. Yeah, I mean, I think Leverato has to negate this. He does, given that he has the second copy of Negate, I think it's a little bit safer. You just, like, you have to be a little wary of what's happening here. It's like, okay, he's going for the end of turn Nexus of Fate. He's going to untap and have access to 10 mana. What can he do? Ooh, he let him do it. Okay. There's a growth spiral off the top of the library. So now what, though, right? You saw that pause. Simon clearly <laughs> has the read that uh, Leverato is sitting on in the gate. He's been playing around it the whole game. And, you know, Simon's big on consistency. He's like, look, if, if, if I'm playing as if my opponent has negate, I have to keep doing it. Oh, and this is going to be really big. Simon's not going to attack again, and I think Leverato might just fire off. Oh, no, never mind. I thought, I thought Simon was going to wait one more turn, see if Leverato fires off Chemistry's Insight, respond with Nexus of Fate, then you can untap safely and play Tamiyo. Okay, well, he can, I mean, he just took the three free damage. Oh, of course, I think the, figured, the Nexus resolved from the previous turn. Right, so he had a turn in the bank there. And let's see what he wants to do now. Is he going to main phase this Nexus? Yes, and then if it gets countered, he might go for Tamiyo then. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I, at this point, I, I'm thinking it might, it might turn around for, for Leverado. Look at, the, look at the patience. 
from from Matthias now, he choosing not to counter any of the Nexus of Fates, thinking, look, I feel like I'm being baited here. I think he's got some kind of Planeswalker here, and I'm going to keep my negates in hand for those cards because I don't yep. think I will die to these creatures. But the really interesting part is he might. <laughs> right. Because he's taking seven here potentially. Absolutely. That's half of his life total. And he might get a window where he can do whatever he wants, but it might not be enough. This is great stuff. Oh, and now Simon has enough to cast Nissa and Tamio in the same turn. So he says, well, you can't have two negates, Yeah, well, right? this is not. Yeah. I will tell you this one is definitely not resolving, and neither <laughs> is the Tamio. Yeah, the, not, neither will. So there's the negate number one, and Simon says, okay, I figured you had that. And right. interestingly, he's now going to force the issue and not play around the second mm, negate, but yeah. he did have both. Of course, Simon will have considered that as an option as well. And as you said, the patience there for Leverado really Leverado paying needs off. a land here. He needs an untapped land, and that was a there huge draw. Now that he found that land, he can play Wilderness Reclamation, and now he has mana to cast Nexus of Fate and untap with Wilderness Reclamation. Oh, wow. Now, next turn, I mean, this creature plan is not even going to work. I mean, Leverado has a biogenic ooze in hand yeah. with Wilderness Reclamation in play. Wow, what a huge swing. You saw Simon Gertzen play around these negates for as long as possible, finally springing his trap but running into not one but two copies of negate. And now Leverado, who let his opponent resolve multiple copies of Nexus of Fate, looks like he's in the driver's seat. Yeah, really curious to see what Leverado does. Leverado actually doesn't have enough green mana to make an extra ooze token. He's got only two copies of Hinterland Harbor. So even if he untaps all those lands, Biogenic Ooze requires three green mana to make an ooze. So he might actually just choose to draw cards because Simon doesn't have a lethal attack. We'll see. Nope. Going for the oozes. Oozing it up. Simon, a little head shake there. Oh, man, I want to know what Simon's thinking now. Maybe he's a little surprised. He's like, you brought an ooze? Maybe it's one of those oh, things, yeah, yeah, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, Because he saw roots in there in, in the previous game. Yeah, right? that's true. <laughs> There's a blink of an eye for Gertzen. Well, let's see what he can find with that. So he can fire this off right now. Ooh, he's going to get rid of the ooze token. All right, he needs to find something nice here, too. He really does. He's got his opponent down to 10. It's a Jade Light Ranger. It's a, it's a threat. Now and he can attack with both and still play Jade Light. Right. And is Leverato going to choose to just block the Jade Light Ranger? I mean, that does give him a lot of extra turns. It does right? indeed, but it's tempting to keep your Biogenicus around, right? Especially with the Re Wilderness Reclamation out. Yeah, but I think I would just block because honestly, if you trade, he doesn't know about the Jade Light Ranger in hand, right? right? So if you take the three and you go to seven, that's three turns of attacks from Simon. So I actually do like this block. It just so happens that Simon found Jade Light Ranger, and Simon actually just really wants to just hit any spell to right. make sure that this is a lethal attack. Right, and he did. Wow, wow he did a great one. This who shakes the world keep keep and now he has seven power on the battlefield the exact amount that he needs to kill leverado so once again the ball is back in leverado's court here yeah this is getting very very tight keep in mind there's a blast zone in play mm -hmm. he could use that to get jay light ranger off the battlefield but that was a big draw nexus of fate Ooh. and and not only that he's got the important thing is having Nexus of Fate and ways to kind of filter through your deck. And yeah. he has all of that. Yeah, he's so got he's Cameo. Got, and two Memorial to Genius. Right. Two Ops and Chemistry's Insight yeah. Graveyard. He's going to see a lot of cards here. He's still looking to be in a good position for Matthias Leverado. Again, he's trying to scrap his way into day number two, but he's got to get by Simon Gertzen to do so. Simon's in the same position, though. If he wins this game, he's into day two. Again, if your fans violate these players, though, a loss here does not eliminate them. So it's not the end of the world. But boy, it's so much easier to just pick up the win right here. Absolutely. So close for both players. Is that a mobilized district? Uh, for for Leverado, yeah, he plays yeah. one. OK. I was like, because I'm just so used to them just playing Blast Zone as mm -hmm. the, the colorless land of choice. There it is. Gather citizens. Here's the Mobilized District hits the battlefield, and here's the Wilderness Reclamation. A couple of mana floating now, giving him a total of 12. He's going to fire off Nexus of Fate, and Simon, Blast see on. the body language. He's not loving this. Yeah, you're going to see Blast Zone tick up to two, probably. Wipe out the Incubation Druid. And at this point, Leverato is just going to be looking for some Nexus of Fates. I mean, 
That's the thing that he needs to find here. Leverado still at seven life, facing down seven power currently with Nissa on top of the library for Gertsen. Right. Keep in mind that uh, there's there's Blast Zone to kill Incubation Druid, and Leverato has the ability to activate Mobilize District to block two. So there, he is not in danger of uh, a lethal attack. Oh, and also Nissa here. Yeah, this this feels like the pendulum swinging right back towards Leverato. He had all the, the opportunity, like at the beginning of the last turn, and that's actually come to fruition now, as he seems to be really starting to take over this game with multiple ways to keep himself alive, and that's really all that matters. He's got the Chemister's Insight plus Tamiyo in hand and on the battlefield, so he can find action no problem. He did tap Hinterland Harbor, which is a little bit strange. I guess he won't. Uh, I, I, oh, I, oh, right, of course, it untaps. So now he has access to up to three blockers, right? He has the Hinterland Harbor, he has the Paradise Druid, and he has Mobilized District that he can activate. So, And knowing that Simon has Nissa on top, Leverato just needs to make sure he doesn't die on the following turn because he's really, really well set up here. Okay, he's going to jumpstart Chemister's Insight, but he just finds two lands off of it. The draw step that was known is Nissa, who shakes the world for Gertsen. But Simon's got his hands full now because he's facing down an opponent that it's really not possible to kill this turn. And now Tamiyo plus Nissa, who shakes the world on the other side of the battlefield. Things could get ugly here for Simon very quickly. Yeah, I think, I think Leverado has the mana to, I mean, we'll see what he does because he can choose to throw away mob Mobilize District to trade with one of the 3-3s. Three he can also choose to sacrifice Blast Zone to kill the Incubation Druid. But then, of course, every time he sacrifices one of his lands, he's effectively losing two mana. However, given that he has Nista who shakes the world and play with Wilderness Reclamation, maybe he doesn't need all that mana. And I think we're going to see a Blast Zone here after blocks are declared. You are correct. Blast Zone gets fired off. And you can see that this board has been well and truly cleared. Three lands in hand now for Leverado, but still with Planeswalker activations to come. Yeah, things looking very good for Leverato here. If you can find something like a Nexus of Fate. And he named Nexus of Fate. And he hit one. Yeah, he has no force in play, actually, with Nissa, who shakes the world. But, of course, Nissa still just has the ability to make a bunch of 3-3s. Three actually, this is a really nice interaction. <laughs> Simon <laughs> likes it, too. This is putting three counters on a 3-3 three -three creature land. So it ends up being 6-6 six -six total, which is enough to kill Nissa in one shot here. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is basically going to, to lock it up here. We have the Mobilized District. We have two active Planeswalkers in play. We have Memorial to Genius to, to draw even more cards here. Leverado finds another copy of Tamiyo, Collector of Tales. He's already got one on the battlefield, however. Yeah. Leverado has a couple of options. Leverado can choose to just try to keep finding Nexus of Fates. He can also minus and get back Negate, because any card that he thinks he can lose to against Simon is likely negatable. And he, that, is, that is exactly what he chooses to do here. Maybe this one looks for Nexus of Fate. Yes, it does. And it already found one as well. So things going very well now for Leverado. It feels like it's impossible at this point for Gertzen to come back. And look at that, just getting in for nine here. Big hit. And, that, and that's the game, right? Next turn, he's going to yep. get in for 12 with the Nissa. That's right. And that's it. Matthias Leverado is going to advance to day number two. Came all the way from Argentina and had to, again, get through a tough player in Simon Gertzen. And Simon's going to be up against the ropes going into the last round there. But for now, 
Wow, really, really impressed by Leverado. I mean, this was a tough field, and he's into day number two. Yeah, I mean, just watching him play Unio, he, he exactly knew how, how this matchup played out, knew what he needed to find, knew, knew how he needed to play the games. And you just saw, he just had a deck that was better suited for this matchup. That's right. And, you know, you mentioned that at the onset when I asked you about running Wilderness Reclamation versus not, and you mentioned that explosiveness, and wow, did we get a chance to see that on camera here. When he had that card down, he just had so many more options per turn than what Simon had. Right, I mean, Wilderness Reclamation in a matchup where you just don't have a way to kill it. We, I talked about how Llanowar Elf is a nice mana creature. Yeah. Wilderness Reclamation is just five Llanowar Elves, <laughs> yes, right, when yes. you resolve it. So <laughs> it just completely takes over games, and that's just the nature of how control matchups play out. Oftentimes, the player with more lands or more mana wins. Yeah, really impressive. And I was just taking a look, by the way, we got some some notes from, uh, from Leverado. And uh, when asked what his favorite standard card was, he said, Nexus of Fate. <laughs> <laughs> and he said uh, he said that type of effect, the one where you get to take an extra turn, he said it's his favorite kind of effect. He also added, it's sweet. <laughs> and I, I have to say, uh, he showed us he showed us why he likes that card so much yeah. because, uh, wow, he is through to day number two. Simon lives to fight another day, so he's yeah. not quite done yet. And we'll, of course, uh, bring you all the updates and, and more. But for now, let's get a word from Maria. Hey, thanks, Marshall. You know what they say, Nexus or Exus. All right, let's take a look at who is in danger coming into this round and give you some updates on who has been eliminated. Take a look. These players at three and three coming into this round, I can let you know that Jessica Estefan, member of the MPL, has been eliminated at three and four. The same is true of Corey Burkhart, eliminated at three and four. And Gianna Kaplan, that's bloody on Twitter, eliminated at three and four. The rest of the players survive, but they're not in great shape heading into the next round. Somebody who is in great shape, however, Leverado in today too, and he's with Becca. Thanks, Maria. That's right. I'm here with Matias Leverado, who is in a fog. You have moved on to day two. Was the Simic ramp that uh, Simon Gertzen brought, was that your ideal matchup? Uh, it was a good matchup, I think, but I know I don't want to play against Nexus because I love Nexus. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to be Nexus. It feels personal. It feels like you're attacking your favorite deck, huh? So I want him to go to do well next round so he can advance too. Yeah, see all the Simic get through. So you're at six and one right now. How does it feel to be moving on to day two? Uh, it's just amazing. Like, it's been a really amazing month. Like, after I qualified for the tournament on Arena, the next weekend at uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, there was a MC qualifier, and I also won with Nexus, so I'm going to Barcelona. So Nexus is pretty good for me, I guess. Yeah, it seems like it's treating you very well. Now I see here you said you'd love to play with Kai Buda. Why is that? Well, I think like Kai and John are legends in this game and it will be amazing to try to, to play against them and see how, how it goes, no? Absolutely. Is there a matchup you're, you're a little worried about? Is there a deck that is more intimidating to pair with? I don't like to play against Mono Red because it can beat you out of nowhere, so I didn't cross anyone already today, so it was good, but that's it. Well, I think uh, you have slim chances, but there are still a few mono red decks, so I'll cross my fingers for you. What about the uh, variations on mono white? Uh, mono white without splash, I think it's good. With splash, it's a good going one, but then it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and also, Esper, the mid with the hero version is not that great after Cyber. But well, let's hope that you get the favorable matchups, uh, and uh, well, I'm sure your fans are hoping that as well. Thank you so much for talking with me. Matias Leverado made it on to day two. Thanks so much to you guys at home for watching. So glad to have you with us. Make sure you stay tuned for more magic after a break. Down to two life. That will do it. I am Andrea Mengucci, I'm from Italy. I am 25 and I'm a professional magic player. Since I was a kid, like I started playing magic at the beach. It's basically been the only game that I've been playing. I was a really, really good at sports, so I was just more like playing on the computer, but always magic. You just became the first champion of the Magic Invitation! 
So I finished my study last year and I was like, okay, great. 2010 will be my professional year. I'll be playing professionally match. Hi, I'm Martin Uza. I'm from the Czech Republic, and I play a lot of Magic. In high school, my friends were playing this interesting game, and I just, you know, I was interested. So I asked them what the, what it is, and it's this, you know, cool strategy game. And like before I knew it, I was buying packs and just like had a, had a huge collection and everything. And like and as the time went by, I started playing tournaments and went to PTQs and whatever. And and now we're here. When I got the phone call, it was an exciting moment. It was just like, you know, there's a lot of things running through your head, and you're like. Oh, we finally made it. This is great. This is all we ever wanted. My name is Luis Salvato. I'm from Argentina. The first time my brother bought some portal decks. We learn how to play, and then 10 years ago, I'm playing professional level. Faxon says that's enough to kill me. Luis Salvato is your. My family and my friends support me a lot. When I found out that I was in the MPL, that I was selected for that, everyone, mostly me, was super excited about this. My name is William Jensen, nicknamed Huey, and I'm here today because I'm a member of the Magic Pro League. I first started playing Magic in 1997. Didn't take me very long to become competitive and start going to tournaments. I was going to weekly tournaments on, on a couple weeknights a week and even Saturdays, and I really liked the, the atmosphere, and I definitely found somewhere where I felt like I belonged. And welcome back to coverage here at Mythic Championship 3. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. Welcome back. We're happy to have you along where we've got all five and ones here. What that means is these players are playing for day two. The winner of each of these matches that we've watched this round is going to be three, through to day two, which is in itself a major accomplishment as we're cutting this field down to just 16 players tomorrow. And boy, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you start looking at that top four when you've gone all the way down to 16. In the feature this round, we've got Kentaro Yamamoto versus Kai Bude. And Wait, he's still at the top? Yeah, he took my challenge very personally, he I did. think. Look at and, how angry uh, he looks. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, he always looks like that. <laughs> uh, as we come into the, into the match here, Kai is up one game to zero over Kentaro, and we're going to see how things pan out. Now, this is a similar situation to the one we had last round where these players, since they are 5-1, and one, it is not an elimination for the loser. It is simply a through for the winner, although a lot more pressure on the loser for sure going into next round. So finally, we get to see a little bit of well, I was going to say mono white, but uh, out of the sideboard, I believe for Kentaro is experimental frenzy. He's splashing for red. Yeah, a little bit of a slower start here for Kentaro. No additional threat on turn one or two. However, one card that is really, really difficult for the Esper hero or control deck to yes, beat I know is what Gideon Blackblade. It's Gideon, you and can never The reason it. being is literally I was playing the Esper deck. My opponent played at turn three. I had six cards in hand, and I lost. Yeah. So then I messaged both you and Luis and went, hey, <laughs> How do I be Gideon Blackblade? And Luis just laughed and said, uh, Night Vale Predator? I'm like, I don't think that's the that's, answer. That's not it. That's not the one. Yeah, you're like, Dees no, that's nope. not it either. And like, you start looking at all your options, and they don't work very well. Right, and that's why you saw Kai choose to take the Gideon Blackblade there with that mm -hmm. Dottie Razor. Very heads-up play there for Kai Booty. You can tell he's played the matchup, especially when you consider Experimental Frenzy is in hand, which is easily the most dangerous thing to see. But with no red mana to cast oh, it, he's taking no. a little risk. And oh no, another copy of it goes in a hand for Kentaro. And this is exactly how Kentaro lost the previous match against Greg Orange, where yeah. his hand was just a bunch of four mana spells. Conclave Tribunals and Experimental Frenzy just kind of being stuck in Kentaro's hand. And right now, I mean, he needs to draw exactly red mana to actually even have a chance in this game. 
Okay, History of Benalia, not the worst if you're not going to draw that red man off the top of the library. So let's get another board state going here for Kentaro as he passes the turn back to Kai. Kai has Teferi Time Raveler. He's got Tefer Teferi Hero of Dominaria available to him this turn, as well as Oath of Kaya. Yeah, curious to see if Kai just chooses to use the Oath of Kai here to get the token off the battlefield here, or just play Teferi and tick it up. Because, you know, if you do do that, the Teferi does go up to five, and it's not really in a lot of danger here outside of something like a Conclave Tribunal. That's right. But... But given that there Hitaru Yamamoto has four cards in hand, <laughs> Kai has to kind of come to the conclusion yeah. that one of them is very likely to be a tribunal. Well, he's seen both of the tribunals. Oh, of course, of course, too. of course. Yeah. So he's yeah. just like, he's going to have to just uh, probably just try to manage this board. Though, you know what? Now that I say that, he's just going to go ahead and run out to ferry. So I assume minus at this point then, yep, if yep. you're going to do he it can. that way. Yeah. And then he can tick up the other to ferry, mm -hmm. which he's already done. Which he did, yep. But yeah, Legion's Landing, not the best draw here. And... And yeah. you know, Yamamoto doesn't really have much of a choice. He's going to have to play out this Legion's Landing well, and use Tribunal. Yeah, but he can then attack. He can also attack, right? So he can get both Planeswalkers off the battlefield if he'd like. Yeah, although I'm not sure he's going to want to use one to remove the time. Does he want to use it to use the time? I mean, he, like you said, he can just attack to ferry here. Mm -hmm. No, he can attack. <laughs> all the creatures. Oh, they all have this turn, so many course, sickness. Yeah, you're right. My bad. So Conclave Tribunal oh. is going to take away Big T and good target. Now what? So now he doesn't want to play Teferi in minus, of course, because Teferi will go down to one loyalty, and then the Legion's Landing token can take it out. S and next turn history, Benali can potentially go up to four. So even if Kai chooses mm. to play Teferi and take it up to five, Kintaro will be able to take it out with Justice Creatures because he's going to have a 4-3 Knight along with the 1-1 token. So this could be a turn where Kai could consider just playing Oath of Kaya to get the knight token off the battlefield and tick up to Fairy Time Raveler. Look at Kai in the tank up there too, just thinking things through, making sure he considers all of the possible options for him as well. There's Oath of Kaya. Yeah, and I do like this play because history is going to chapter three. He doesn't want to his Teferi to die to just attacks. He wants Yamamoto to at least Ooh. use a tribunal. Man, I got to say, Paul, <laughs> you know, given that that Experimental Frenzy was like probably the worst draw for Kentaro a couple of turns ago, he has done just fine ever since, even on just the three white mana sources of Gideon Blackblade this turn off the top of the library. Yeah, absolutely. And Kentaro probably going, yeah, Kentaro definitely going to be attacking this Teferi Time Raveler. Definitely don't want to give Teferi the ability to bounce something and draw a card. Yeah, a little drainy drain here from the Oath of Kaya. Thank you very much. And there is Gideon Blackblade on the battlefield. And this continues to put Teferi here of Dominaria in a very awkward spot because Teferi goes down to one if you use the minus ability, which then leaves you vulnerable to that token. However, if you go to five, Kentaro has exactly five power on the battlefield next wow. turn. Just perfect. Now, if Kentaro can find a red mana source, he could just blow the doors off this thing, too. Absolutely. I mean, he's doing fine keeping up and keeping the right amount of pressure on Kai Buddha here, even without it. But let's not forget, he is one red mana source away from Experimental Frenzy. Yeah, and all these aggressive white decks have, have kind of figured out what you need for this matchup. Oftentimes, if you have a legendary permanent, you only want to go up to three, especially if you're playing an aggressive deck. But they, they identified Gideon is the most important card to try to have a chance against these control matchups. So they just go up to the full four. Wow, and now history of Penelia off the top of the library, too. Hey, you know, if you're going to get stuck on three planes, I like drawing Gideon into history <laughs> about as often as you can. And as you mentioned, of course, this 1-1 one, one lifelink token has just enough power to send uh, Teferi Hero of Dominaria pack in. Yeah, although now Teferi Time Raveler is sitting at three, mm -hmm. Kai could choose to use the minus ability on Time Raveler, bounce Conclave Tribunal, get that Teferi, draw another card, or he can just use the minus effect to bounce Oath of Kai and play Oath of Kai and kill a token. But never mind, everything yeah. has changed. Cancel that plan. <laughs> Ugin the Ineffable has shown up in hand now for, uh, for Kai, and he may prefer just to do that instead. Yeah, he does, however, know about that Conclave Tribunal in Kentaro's hand, so he has to choose wisely here. Okay, so first things first, he's going to cash into Fairy Time Raveler to get rid of the 2 2 Knight token, the first chapter of History of Benalia, then play Ugin. And this 1 1 token has done serious work, though. Yeah, and I, oh, and I love what he's doing here. Yeah, this is beautiful stuff. Now he can get rid of the entire board from his opponent. He blew up the Conclave Tribunal. With Ugin, that got him back 
another Planeswalker in the form of Teferi, which he then used to kill the token. Now, his Planeswalkers are on a lowly one loyalty, but that's plenty when your opponent has no creature. Yeah, so I imagine he's going to use the Tribunal here on the Ugin, because mm -hmm. the Ugin make, makes an actual blocker, and just hope that Kai doesn't draw anything off the Teferi, because he can finish off the Teferi next turn if Kai doesn't draw anything in his top two draw steps. Here we go, big draw step, and it's a D-Spark off the oh, top of the big. library for Kai Bude, a perfect draw here. That'll get him the Ugin back. Yeah, now he can use D Spark on the Ugin. Uh, sorry, on the Tribunal on the Ugin, and then play the Ugin here. Takes away Banalish Marshal with Thought Erasure first and foremost. Stranding once again those two copies of Experimental Frenzy in hand for Kentaro, who is short on both the fourth mana and the red mana. Yeah, and he might just get this Knight token off the battlefield here. Oh, really? Th you don't want to set yourself up for potential an additional uh, Conclave Tribunal off the top, and if you do this, oh. he can't play it. Great point, Paul. So let's see what he does. Yeah, that's exactly what he's going to do. Hey, sometimes you just have to work your way through the history of Benalia tokens one at a time. It doesn't feel great, but you can do what you got to do, and there's Gideon Blackblade off the top. Man, I'm telling you, if you're not going to draw a red source, <laughs> just keep doing this, Kentaro. If you just keep drawing all the three drops, that's better than, you know, drawing those lowly Sky Marcher aspirants. Exactly. On he's, he's making our job fun, I'll tell you that. But tick tock, because Kai Buddha is drawing two cards a turn thanks to Teferi, and he's affecting the board positively regardless of what those cards are thanks to Ugin. So, you know, the window will close. Oh, and there's Clifftop Retreat, though. Boy, yeah. I guess Kai's going to be happy he has that D Spark around, isn't he? He is. I mean, at least Ken for the first one. Right. He, Kentaro's going to run out the Frenzy. Kai's going to despark, and then he's going to run out the other Frenzy. The problem is this Ugin. It's generating a chump blocker every turn and also gaining Kai 2 and dealing 2, and it's just going to be really hard to fight through. And the Mono White deck doesn't have a lot of just cheap, efficient spot removal. No, it that... has strong removal in the Tribunal, but it doesn't just, you know, you're not going to board in Baffling End here. So now this has Kai taking no damage or loyalty lost and effectively drawing three cards a turn? Yeah, however, Kentaro is on six on Gideon Blackblade, so he can actually use Gideon's minus six ability to ah. exile target non-land permanent, which is something that he might be looking to do soon. He might just have to, right? Whether he wants to or not. There's Hostage Taker off the top of the library for Kai. Not amazing here. Yeah, I think By the way, and I, I should mention it, he, Kentaro did land Experimental Frenzy in between at the end of his turn there. So right. Kai is going to want to get rid of that, but he Absolutely. knows about the other one as well, so it's not over yet. This is more like a tempo play currently. Right. I mean, you don't want Kentaro to untap with, you know, five lands in play and just play out a bunch of permanents. So you want to at least just give the, get that additional turn where you can kind of get your card advantage engine going with both Teferi and Ugin in play. The planes on top of the library there for Kentaro is the draw step. Now he needs to call Frank Carson and decide if he should play the land first or play the fair. <laughs> I never first. know. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I you know. shouldn't have played the land. Now you know. <laughs> There's Experimental Frenzy right back on the battlefield. So it is kind of crazy because both players have now really hit their stride on doing the most powerful things that their decks can do. Gideon Blackblade with the Experimental Frenzy rolling right along here for Kentaro, but is he outclassed by the two Planeswalkers on the other side? It feels like it. Yeah, it definitely is, because Kai, he has the Ugin on three, and he's got Teferi on four, so he has two Planeswalkers in play that are both able to deal with the Frenzy in play. So does he have to cash in this Gideon at this point to stem the bleeding at least on one of these Planeswalkers and then hope that Experimental Frenzy brings him what he, what he needs? Yeah, I mean, I guess if he did it on Teferi, if, Yama, if, if Kai wants to deal with the Experimental Frenzy, he would have to just straight up lose the Ugin. So maybe that's what he chooses to do here. Minus six, the Gideon Blackblade to kill Teferi to force Kai to minus three with the Ugin, leaving him with no permanence in play. That could be something that he goes for. Or Okay, it looks like he's just going for the Ugin and just going, you know what, I'm okay with drawing this later. And, uh, you know, I'll still just rely on Experimental Frenzy as his win condition. But keep in mind, there's a land on top of Yamamoto's deck. He's not going to be doing anything, at least next turn. Right. So Kentaro is going to have to sit for a little while here and just watch Kai Buda run it up here with Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. And this one really feels like it slipped away now from Kentaro. He's been behind for the last multiple turns and now drawing a planes this turn and just having to say go. 
That yep. is going to be really tough to come back from. It's just so point. hard to kind of try to play this late game attrition war against a deck with Teferi and Ugin. I mean, the Frenzy does give you some hope, but, I mean, that hand would just ended up simply being too slow. Mm -hmm. And Kentaro just, you know, we, we saw this previously. It happened before. He was just stuck there with, you know, four four drops in his hand with three lands in play. Kind of interesting. He actually drew Experimental Frenzy for the turn here. <laughs> So he's got access to a lot of them. I mean, if Kai has to kill every single one of them, that does get problematic at some point because he's drawn another one next turn. Well, what, what Kai can do here is minus on the Frenzy, then cast Enter to God Eternals, targeting Kintari Yamamoto <sighs> oh. and milling both of the Experimental Frenzies. He didn't because that's do it. Because that's really the only way Kintaro can come back from this. Yeah, that would have been sweet, but he didn't. So now he hits Law Rune Enforcer, which looks... A little underpowered for this board. Okay, Teferi. Oh. Now he can shuffle, he can mill away the experimental frenzy that's upcoming. And then try to deal with the one on the battlefield. It looks like Hostage Taker is going to grab that Law Rune Enforcer in the meantime. All right, it looks like Kai just wants to build up an overwhelming board presence, which he's very capable of doing with his hand here. Double Tyrant Scorn with Enter to God Eternals. I mean, I don't even know if four creatures in a row off the Frenzy will get this done, right. given Kai's hand. Yeah, the, the game really did just swing, but let's see what he can do. Here's Kentari Yamamoto with Sky Marcher Aspirant. He hits a land, that's fine. What else? Oh, mm. sac <laughs> sac geez. Sacred Foundry. Yeah, and this should seal the deal here. Womp, we're gonna, as we're gonna, we say, yeah. <laughs> yep, we're going to see an end of, end of turn Tyrant Scorn here on the Sky Marcher Aspirant. Oh, looks like maybe not. Another Oath of Kaya off the top of the library there for Buddha. But now he's going to use Teferi to get rid of the Experimental Frenzy again. This is the third time that that's happened this game. And we are seeing Kai Bude line up a victory here, getting rid of those Experimental Frenzies once and for all. And he's going to be into day two here at Mythic Championship 3. I mean, we did talk about it. He's clutch. He, he really is. Well, he usually is only clutch on Sundays. That's right. his, I mean... Just he makes it to Sunday. Boy, he's made it to Saturday, though. I don't see any way out here for Kentaro. Well, see how many cards you can get off of this, but don't think this is going to do it. So which one's the aggro deck here, just uh, for the record? <laughs> well, this is where, where, you know, the... the where the control deck turns the corner yes. and kind of establishes dominance, which, I mean, it happened like five turns ago. I feel like he picked up the corner and hit Kentaro on the head with it because that mm. is game number two and the match going to one of the legends of our game, Kai Bude, and he is through to day number two. Congratulations to Kai. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the deck that you want to play against when you're playing this Esper deck. You're, you're playing a ton of removal. You have access to sweepers in the sideboard. You have Oath of Kai. You have lots of incidental life gain. And everything just lined up perfectly for him. And that, coupled with the fact that Kentaro just was off to a very slow start in that game, too. I mean, Kai basically locked it up when he basically missed land drop number four. Yeah, that was super tough. So we've actually got Becca with Kai right now. Thanks, Marshall. I am standing here with Kai Buddha. Kai has made it on to day two. Are you excited? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, I haven't done well in, like, quite a while. I've, I've had some money finishes and stuff, but, like, going 6-1 here is pretty exciting. Yeah, and going from 68 to 16 isn't bad either. Now, you just played against Kentaro Yamamoto's Boros Aggro. That's a pretty good matchup for you, right? It is a good matchup for me, and he also got incredibly unlucky in both games. So, yeah, I mean... I'll take it. <laughs> Talk me through the matches, what you were thinking, what happened that was so unlucky for, for, for Kentaro. Well, first of all, he mulliganed in game one, and then he's splashing some red cards, but he only has eight red sources, and then he ended up drawing two of them and never drew a red source in one of the games. I mean, he found it eventually, but th at that point, it was just way too late. What was very helpful is that a uh, friend of mine, Brett Nelson, he told me to not bring in Kaya's Wrath in this matchup, which I think was probably correct, and I didn't do it, and it felt like that was a, a good choice for the specific, like for the specific version of the deck that uh, Kentaro was playing. It, it was very helpful to actually not have that card in my deck. 
wait a minute, because I think white weenies, I think, of course you want to have the Kaya's Wrath in there. What is Brad's secret that he shared with you, and why is this the reason? What's the reason for doing that? So, the problem for this matchup is that he is very resilient to Wrath. He's playing four Danto Vanguards, which uh, can be made Im uh, immune to destruction abilities. And then he has multiple Gideons, a Planeswalker, which doesn't get killed by Wrath. And he just, I mean, it, it just seemed easier for me to, like, overrun him with my creatures because. Like my, obviously his creatures are faster, but I do have a lot of life gain. And with cards like Hostage Taker and Enter the God Eternals, it's very easy to just spiral that out of control. And with Hero of Priest and One. So it felt like it was better for me to just create a big board state with as many creatures as possible on both sides. And just have my, like my cards are more powerful and have enough life gain to get to the mid game. And yeah, that, that was my game plan to just uh, stall the game out and then have my more powerful cards take over. Amazing, I love that. Bringing an Esper deck and then your strategy is to go wide. Not something you usually hear. Kai Buddha, no one's going to be surprised to see that you made it to day two, but congratulations. Well, Marshall, apparently, he, d he didn't like my chances, so yeah. Well, thanks so much for you guys watching at home. Stay tuned because we have more magic coming up after a short break. I'm Alexander Hain. I'm from Canada and member of the NPL. When I really got into magic was college. Both my parents come from an academic background. So for them, success in school was, was number one. They didn't really understand. And then Saturday night of the Pro Tour, my mom got to meet me and the team at the, the event and ended up winning. And it was quite something. Since then, she's gone like full blown fan of magic. My name is Carlos Romão. I'm former 2002 World Champion. I remember when I won my first invite to the Pro Tour, told my father, okay, so this is a professional magic tournament. My father was like, you take like A grades on the school and then you can go. My family was always supportive since the beginning. Like without them, I wouldn't be able to be here. When I got the call, I heard, okay, so we're gonna sign you a contract. And I told my father, and he was so excited. I remember that my mother picked up the phone and said, oh, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. Without them, I couldn't achieve anything when it comes to the game. My name is Eric Froelich. I'm in the Magic Pro League and the Magic Pro Tour Hall of Fame. It just so happened that my entire fifth grade class really just started getting into magic. I wanted to go to the local game store. I uh, went with my dad and we bought a nice little starter kit at the time. My dad ended up reading the entire rule book, teaching me how to play, and I played with my classmates. I ended up finding myself winning and winning and advancing all the way to the top eight and qualifying for the Pro Tour at 13 years old. And at that point, I was just fully immersed and wanting to go to every major tournament around me. And that's what I did. I was lucky enough to have really supportive parents who found a way to make sure everything I needed to go to, I was there. I'm John Rolfe from Omaha, Nebraska. I've been playing Magic for about 15 years. I played Pro Tour Ixalan, which I thought was gonna be my last Pro Tour, and I ended up top fouring the whole thing. And so then it gave me this awesome opportunity, and I've always wanted to pursue this, why not take a chance? And then I just kept winning, and now we're here, so. <laughs> When I got the call to join the MPL, at first I was just shocked. I had to think about it for a really long time, and Magic had been such a big part of my life that I had to at least see where the future goes. I mean, I didn't want to live with any regrets. with his opening hand. My name is Piotr Głogowski. I live in Poland, Poznań. I have been playing Magic since return to Ravnica before uh, joining the Magic Pro League. I have been streaming MTGO. I hope that uh, with the advent of the MPL and uh, Magic Arena, I can expand on that. I'm certainly not going to leave the older formats that I love in the dust.
Draw two, discard two, and straight into the concession. Wow. Reed Duke equal. My name's Reed Duke. I'm a longtime professional Magic player, and I'm a member of the inaugural Magic Pro League this year. My uh, older brother Ian and I learned to play together, and I started taking it real seriously once I was uh, around college age, and I've been a pro for about six or seven years. Declare my attack, says Reed Duke. Autumn says, you got it, and scoops up. I come from a tremendously supportive family, and my mother and I sort of have this joke that I'll come home, and she'll say, I was the tournament, and I'll say, oh, well, I lost in the finals, or she'll say, well, you're still a winner to me. Hey everybody, welcome back to coverage of Mythic Championship 3. Welcome back to the news desk. I'm Maria, that's Day9, that's Cedric Phillips, the loveliest members of coverage up here on the yes. stage, gentlemen. Yes, we that's placed. True. That's just true. <laughs> so what have you been, I don't know, Cedric, you've been in the booth all day. Have you seen some cool stuff out there or what? I mean, there's been some interesting decks. So, you know, we've, of course, done our metagame breakdowns. I know you've handled here in the booth with Sean. And we've seen a little bit of everything at this stage of things. We've seen Simon's awesome Simic ramp deck. We've seen Simic Nexus. We have seen aggressive white decks lose Ooh. a lot. 